If you are a Mozart fan and perhaps even a Don Giovanni fan, then it certainly is interesting for you to know that Mozart's Don Giovanni is one of the most intriguing case studies we have on the field of historical tempo reconstruction. And don't click away if you don't care about tempo reconstruction or whatever, you're still gonna love this story, I promise. So hello everybody, my name is Wim Winters and this channel is all about exploring the music from Bach to Beethoven and beyond with a single goal to inspire you on your journey as a musician or as a music lover. And the story and the context that I'm about to present to you in this video is so extremely clear. The facts are so easy to check. The outcome is so incredibly powerful that as a whole this showcase is an annoying challenge for anyone claiming double beat is obviously nonsense. I've presented these questions to dozens of the musicians and musicologists who claim to know for sure we should play everything much faster, who keep telling you your tempi are too slow, who force you to practice until your hands and arms hurt from over practicing and up to today I received zero answers and the reason why is rather simple. There's only one context and solution in which all of this fits and what that might be I will reveal to you in this video for which you and I need to travel through time first back to Leipzig, 1839. That year of 1839, a long time after Mozart premiered his opera Don Giovanni in Prague in 1787, we enter the study room of a gentleman named Gottfried Wilhelm Fink. We see the man at his desk finishing an article of which he knows it will cause shockwaves through the musical landscape of his days. He didn't care about popularity at all anymore, because being 56 years old, having just received an honorary doctorate at the Leipzig Faculty of Philosophy, one of the numerous awards he was blessed with, Gottfried Fink was at the height of his career as a composer, music theorist, and poet. Fink was also the editor of the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung, one of the most, if not the most influential magazine that between 1798 and 1848 weekly provided lengthy articles and reviews on the daily musical practices of its time. Schumann and Liszt, only to name two, were prominent authors for the so-called Leipzig AMZ, that in 1839 was presided by our friend Gottfried Wilhelm Fink. Let's move silently to his desk to try read over his shoulder some of the passages that indeed would make a huge impact. The title makes clear that it will be about Mozart. On the necessity to deliver Mozart's main works to our time, with metronome numbers showing how the master himself executed his works. The article starts very strong. Let's read together, and I quote. We all know how many bitter complaints there are about the complete destruction of Mozart's music because of too fast tempi. These complaints are right. If it were only ignorant beginners, who made the error in taking too fast and tasteless tempi? This all would be not be worth talking about. But we have witnessed this evil habit often with conductors, who in their own art do not only possess knowledge, but who have also the power of creation themselves, and are able to bring beauty out of newly composed music." End of quote. Well, 
That's interesting, isn't it? So let's skip a few lines here and continue reading. No doubt about what our friend Fink wants to say. And I quote, It all comes close indeed to a formal race, so incomprehensible wild and barbarian are they treating Mozart's creations. Fink makes lots of similar strong statements that must have fallen hard on the new generation of musicians of his time. I'll come back to this article in future videos, but let us finish by reading the simple explanation why, according to Fink, all of this is happening. That reason is obvious. It's as simple as one can imagine, and here it is. The vanity of the art of virtuosity has put itself on top of it all. And the main problem is that this habit of playing way too fast had far-reaching and immediate consequences. I quote, The feeling for what's right is lost because of this much-repeated habit. When you would stop watching now and present this information to the academic world of today, you'll be received with an all-knowing smile that the explanation is so simple that it is surprising that you and I were not smart enough to think about it ourselves. The academic world of today would answer that Fink only writes that because he was infected by the romantic taste. A taste that advocated for slower tempi, not faster. In other words, Fink objects the historical Mozart tempi he still heard in 1839. Original tempi that indeed were, no questions asked, way faster than what he advocated for. Point made, next page. Their only factual argument to back that opinion is the fact that most of today's academic world would agree on that. It would be great to see one single historical quote that underlines something that's nothing more than an opinion. But that as a side remark. There is an obvious weak spot in this opinion that on itself should be enough to kill all discussion in that direction. Like many of that generation, also Fink refers to the original tempi taken by Mozart. He even advocates to invite musicians that played with Mozart or heard him perform to preserve a tradition of performance practice that he describes as being lost rapidly. It would indeed be a dangerous game to invite those old musicians still close to Mozart as first-hand witnesses if your goal was to completely change a still existing Mozart tradition. Only that counter-argument would be enough to start a discussion over again. But as said at the beginning, this case provides much stronger arguments and let's continue for that reason. Let's continue by introducing to you the second main character of this video, Mr. Václav Tomacek, contemporary of Fink. And by the way, both were of the same generation as Ludwig van Beethoven who had been a friend to both in their earlier days of life. In 1839, Tomacek enjoyed an international reputation as pianist, composer and teacher. His musical activities were centered in and around Prague, a city to which he moved already in 1791, at the age of 17. In that year, the year of Mozart's death, Tomacek visited numerous concerts, among which several performances of Don Giovanni. And when Václav sat in the audience listening to the still incredibly popular Mozart opera, he basically heard the same orchestra as Mozart was conducting four years earlier. Returning to our friend Gottfried Fink, the connection Tomacek had with these 1791 Mozart performances fitted perfectly in his plans to bundle as many tempo indications from people who have heard Mozart perform. In this case, of course, it is true that we are dealing with someone, Tomacek, who in fact never heard Mozart, not even met the composer. Fink acknowledges that, but underlines in his article the importance of Tomacek's contribution like this, and I quote, 
The tempi are exactly given as the famous man countless times heard the opera performed by the orchestra who has studied it under Mozart's direction. Only one member of that orchestra still lives today, but he is too old to be still useful for what we want to achieve." End of quote. So yes, Tomacek heard the orchestra four years after Mozart had left. And although we may assume that many aspects of Mozart's way of conducting the opera was present still in 1791, of course there is no way we can verify if that aspect is true. More important factor of doubt, however, is the fact that Tomacek gave these metronome numbers for Don Giovanni in 1839. This almost half a century after 1791 performance. The tempi may or may not reflect those of 1791, and even the tempi of 1791 may or may not reflect those of 1787, date of the Mozart performance. So, what is the relevance of the Tomacek tempi indications for Don Giovanni, and why did I even call it one of the most important case studies for tempo research? Because it is totally irrelevant how much or how little these 1839 metronome numbers represent Mozart's own tempi of 1787. It would be an interesting case study, yes, on its own. But the only thing what is relevant for our topic to discuss is that we know for a hundred percent that these tempi reflected the way Tomacek would conduct Don Giovanni. Or at the bare minimum, he would conduct the opera if asked to give his view on an historical Mozart reconstruction. And now we open the door to the central point. <laughs> have two elements here. Firstly, Fink wants to collect original Mozart tempi to show young musicians how much slower compared to their performances Mozart originally was meant to be played. And secondly, to illustrate his point he asked Tomacek to metronomize the opera Don Giovanni which he heard perform in Prague 1791. So far so good. What's the point of conflict here, you may ask? The point of conflict is this. Tomacek's tempi for Don Giovanni are fast beyond imagination. And to add another conflict on top of that, Fink approved those tempi, all of them. We know because he published every single metronome number in his article. In other words, Gottfried Fink used incredibly fast metronome numbers to showcase that Tempi in 1839 were way too fast. If you would expect, in line with what the academic world answers us, that Fink wants to romantically, whatever this means, slow down the original Mozart Tempi, as if they know what those original Tempi were, why using metronome numbers that are in many cases beyond the edge of humanly possible? Wouldn't you expect the Tomacek metronome numbers then to be slow in the first place? You see the point? The tempi of Tomacek are already unbelievably fast, many of which are impossible. And yet, if those metronome numbers are correct, and considered to be perfectly normal, and they were since they were directly approved by Fink, we must assume that in 1839 orchestras and singers performed even faster, way faster even, so at speeds we cannot even imagine today. Of course, if you're new here to this kind of tempo research, all of this reconstruction makes no sense if you consider this from the perspective of single beat performance practice, where this single tick of a metronome represents the note value in the metronome equation. As we've been told for decades that that's the way people in the early 19th century used their metronome. Let me give you just one example to showcase how ridiculous this is. 
One excerpt will open your eyes and ears and you can look for yourself for many more. It's an interesting experiment, I can promise you. Here is a fragment of an aria, the last part of number 19 in the anime edition, as sung today. I deliberately made the clip sound like a recording of 1935-ish to make it unrecognizable since we're gonna use it to showcase the other tempi as well. Here it is. So if we apply to this aria too much extempo, the singer suddenly needs to produce over nine syllables per second. Here's a fragment again. Now, it's up to you whether you believe this is still possible or not, or whether this still makes sense musically or not, but we're not there yet. The academic world stops at this Tomacek number, not really knowing how to reply on an incredibly fast MP like this, but they should go one step further. We're only now approaching the essence of this topic. Fink writes that Mozart's music is performed way faster than it should. So, way faster than Tomacek. We can debate forever what way faster really means, but it's not just 5%. Let's add 30% to the Tomacek tempo, of which you easily could say it's even not way faster. But anyway, you get this. And that is beyond ridiculous. Many of the Tomacek tempi are already on the edge or beyond possible. Something even the biggest advocates for single beat metronome numbers admit, as for instance Hermann Breidenstein in part 13 of the Mozart studies described some of these tempi indications as just foolish. So now we have four points, two more than before. First of all, Fink wants to collect original Mozart tempi to show young musicians of 1839 how much slower Mozart originally was meant to be played. Secondly, to illustrate his point he asked Tomacek to, give met to metronomize the opera Don Giovanni which he heard perform in Prague 1791. Three, of the metronome numbers Tomacek gave, the academic world agrees many are problematic if not impossible. And four, with this in mind, we must accept, as a fact, that orchestras in 1839 played even faster than this. The last point is the core argument for the Don Giovanni Tomacek case, but you'll never hear it. If ever this issue is discussed, you'll hear musicologists stop at number 3, the metronome numbers by Tomacek. They will tell you that there was too much time between 1839 and 1791 to still hold these metronome numbers as truthful for Mozart. But we've seen that's just a deflection from the real issue. Even if Tomacek was completely wrong, his tempi were approved by Fink. All of them. I cannot repeat this enough. And we know for a fact that musicians at the time played way faster than even this. So what other conclusion can be drawn that all of these metronome numbers simply were metrical, or double beats so to speak, where the two ticks formed the unity of one schlag, I'm sorry for the piano, or beat. Only when these metronome numbers of Tomacek were in double beat metronome use, there is a possibility to reconstruct this showcase. And it suddenly is simple. No need to doubt Tomacek's ability anymore. No need for mystery. Performing the Mozart opera and Tomacek's metronome numbers in double beat 
will give you room for acceleration in performance. You will even will be able to perform it way faster, as being described in 1839 by Fink. It's as simple as that. There is absolutely no way that from the perspective of the single beat use of the metronome, where one tick represents the note value of the metronome equation, that that theory can bring this story into a context that makes sense, other than people in those days achieved something physically that we somehow have lost in our century. You think I'm kidding. But yes, I've even read that explanation as a conclusion published in a paper on a very high academic level. Up to you to decide what direction you go into. Part of the results of Tomacek and Double Beat can be heard by clicking on this video over here. I need some singers to continue, but I'd very much would love to reconstruct that opera for you. So if you like what you've heard and would like to help us make more videos like this, there is a link to our Patreon page below and in the description box. And for now, thanks for watching and see you soon again. Bye.